Uh, with us right now, the Vice Chair of Finance in the House of Delegates, Delegate John Hardy. John, good morning, sir. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you guys for uh, giving me the opportunity here this morning. Great to have you with us. Uh, let's see, we are on, what, day 16 down there, John? I don't know if you're counting or not, but uh, we're about uh, a quarter of the way through the session. No, I don't, I don't keep count. It's, it's really, it's, uh, you know, it, I've, I've talked about this before. It's really a little bit of a strange experience down here. I have to try to figure out what day it is, um, what the weather's like, because it's just kind of just living under the dome. I'm usually here around 6.30 in the morning, and then I'm usually get back. Like last night, I got back to my apartment about 9.30. Um, it's in, uh, you know, you're just spending a lot of time in the Capitol, and you're kind of living in this little world. And, and uh, you know, I think my wife told me that you guys got a little bit of weather or something yesterday, and I saw some snow on Facebook, but, like, you know, it just kind of rained here. But it's, it's you're kind of really disconnected, and that's, that's the best way to put it. You're just kind of disconnected, so, well, the, the outside world. The governor is going to be in Martinsburg on Tuesday, and that will be uh, to pitch his personal income tax cut as he tours the state doing that. This is a cut that passed overwhelmingly in the House of Delegates but has gotten caught up in the Senate, John. Are we making any progress in negotiations between the House and the Senate in moving this along? Well, I think, um, you know, I think the House is pretty settled on where we need to be and where we want to be. Uh, the Senate is still uh, taking their time to work through the, the, the tax cut and uh, – I'm not sure exactly, you know, where they're going to fall on that. Uh, I'm going to work, you know, as hard as I can, get the best legislation out of the House uh, and get it sent over to them, and then it kind of falls into their purview what they want to do with it. But, uh, you know, I think there's probably uh, some talks going on in the background and uh, trying to come to some type of consensus. I think the governor is out uh, doing his sales pitch. He's trying to let uh, West Virginians know, and I, and I, and I hope that uh, the governor – keeps that civil. I hope the governor stays on message and stays on on target and talking about just what a good thing this is and and, and how this would help West Virginians and really, um, you know, doesn't really kind of strike out or lash out at, at our, our Senate colleagues and just says, you know, kind of keeps it positive and, and keeps a nice positive sales pitch. So I think that's the game plan. Um, sometimes the governor doesn't always stick to the game plan. So you know, it's it's always interesting to see how these things will play out. This, uh, there's an article from the Tax Foundation by Jared Walzak, and it says, West Virginia is being left behind on tax relief. It talks about the evolution of West Virginia from a Democrat-nominated do state to a Republican-dominated state. But then there's a line in here that says the real parties in West Virginia essentially aren't Republican or Democrat. They're House, Senate, and Executive Branch. John. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting line. I mean, you know, to me, I'm a, I'm a little concerned, and and you know, I've I've also you know made the point of view that I'm not going to say anything uh, derogatory about the executive branch or my Senate colleagues. I'm going to work in my I'm going to work in my perspective house and pass the best legislation that I can out of this house, uh, and then that's really you know that's that's the purview of the other branches to do as they will and and the powers to be to work on that. But it is a little disconcerting that. Uh, with having a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a and a Republican ish uh, executive branch, <laughs> that uh, we we can't get some tax relief. I mean, we've been going around here pounding ourselves on the chest and talking about the record surpluses and right sized government and controlling spending, and those are all things that we have done. I mean, we we have done all those things, and we have these record surpluses, and some of those are some of that is from. Uh, you know, being very fiscally responsible, what we're doing and and making our agencies work within the budgets that they have and in those confines. And and some of it, it has to do with you know record global energy prices for severance taxes and and the energy economy doing very well. But uh, it's it's a little concerning that here we are uh, talking all the time about the the massive surpluses that we have and we can't give a little tax relief to. Uh, our West Virginia taxpayers, and I think the tax bill that we passed was a very, fa very, very, very fair. It touched every West Virginia taxpayer. It's a very safe way to move. It's a uh, fiscally responsible. It, it takes small bites of the apple. It's a, uh, it's uh, incremental politics, which I'm a fan of. Uh, we can always pump the brakes if we need to. Uh, we've put a $700 million um, uh, emergency fund, which we have that now. It's not future money. That's not money that we're hoping to get. That's money that's in the bank right now, um, you know, and that's about 70 uh, percent of what we keep in our rainy day fund. So, you know, you're between your rainy day fund and that emergency that emergency fund, there's, you know, about one point seven billion dollars sitting there and, and that money's allocated for, for the for tax uh, 
tax relief. So to me, it's a very sound plan, and I'm not exactly sure. I know the Senate colleagues are wanting to do a little bit uh, maybe of a more of a forensic, deeper dive um, on the plan, uh, and that's their that's their thought process, and they, you know, obviously they can do whatever they want to do on their side. So, Senator Ryan Weld was on with us earlier this week. He said one of the sticking points is the Senate doesn't believe the projections that the governor's office has put forth of billion-dollar surpluses over the next three years, uh, each individually a billion dollars or more, and that the way the governor laid out his future, future projections uh, – led to some doubt because it didn't take into account some basic accounting principles of of deducting money that's already being allocated someplace else, for instance. So as a result, they're quite skeptical in the Senate. John, are you confident in those projections the governor's office has put forth? I'm very confident in, in the projections for the next 12 months. I mean, you know, it is hard to project out that 24 and 36. I mean, that starts to get a little bit more fuzzy. Um, but I'm very confident in our projections for the next 12 months, and that will cover us for the 30 percent that we have. And then if we see where, um, you know, our revenues are falling off and, you know, and and we're not hitting the mark, the benchmarks that we think we need to hit, we can, you know, we are the legislature. We can always come in and slow down that first 10 percent. But, you know, and and when we did all of that, when we did all the numbers and the projections, we didn't we did zero dynamic scoring for growth. So we scored that and 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 did that as if there was going to be no economic growth in the state moving forward from that. And we know, or we're you know we're pretty certain that as we start to cut personal income tax, and ex- especially as we start to get close to that 50 percent mark, that we're going to see some type of dynamic growth and economic expansion in the state that's going to start replacing some of those revenues. So I think the Senate's plan, you know, I can't speak for them, but I've heard rumors down here, and, and I've heard it enough times that I feel confident enough to say it on the radio. I think the Senate is wanting to do 50% at one time, and they want to do some tax shifting. They want to do, you know, some two, like a 2% consumer sales tax, and that's the rumor. I and mean, there's, there's, I haven't seen that on paper, but that's kind of what they're talking about. And I, I think that's probably a non-starter for the House. I mean, we're looking at, you know, record surpluses and, and our and our taxpayers are facing, you know, 40 year high inflation, double digit inflation. I think the last thing in the world we want to do is, is add a, a tax shift to to our, our taxpayers, T- take it from one place, but get it someplace else. So yeah, that that remains to be seen. There may be some movement for that. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's movement in the House for that, and if that's truly what the Senate wants to do. But, uh, you know, we, we still got a good bit of time here. We the House was able to get that out early. And um, give the Senate plenty of time to uh, to uh, what's a positive thing I can say here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say drag their feet. Let's just say give the Senate plenty of time to Mull do their over. in depth their in depth investigation and deep dive that they want to do. Well, I think your gut feeling on that is correct. By the way, if you tell people, "Hey, we've got uh, three straight years running, and there's three more years coming of billion dollar surpluses," so we're giving you a tax cut. But by the way, give us some of it back with the sales tax increase. I think your gut on that well, one is that's correct. Kind of, that's a hard that's a hard sell in today's inflationary economy. I mean, people are paying seven dollars a dozen for eggs, and fuel prices are still up. Groceries are through the roof, and and energy. I mean, and 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 energy cost is up, and so you know that's a really that's a hard sell for me to make. John Gilstrap. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I, I call this situation from where I sit, looking you know at the outside and, and watching the 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 legislature do its thing. I call this violent agreement where everybody seems to under be on the same page. We want to have uh, income tax cuts. And now we get into the details. And as we fight over the details on a finite period of time, what are the, what's the likelihood? Is there a reasonable likelihood? I want to ask you to put numbers on it. Is there a reasonable likelihood that this session ends without the income tax cut that everybody wants? So I believe there's a very, very real, chance that that could happen. I think there's a very real chance that we come out of here of this 60-day session with no uh, tax reforms or tax relief for West Virginia taxpayers. And I think that would be a completely um, sad day and it would be a sad thing. Uh, but I, I do believe that it's possible that uh, this this may not happen. And, uh, you know, the House and the executive branch um, seems to be pretty close on the same page, um, uh, at least from what I get from Secretary Hardy and, and what the governor said in his state of, state of the state speech and, and had a, have had a few meetings with the governor's staff. 
um, you know, they seem to be pretty close to where the House is, and the Senate is kind of the outlier right now, and they're working, not saying that they're not doing their, their business, and they're working through what they need to do to get their members comfortable. Um, so I think that's a, poss- that's a real possibility. I, I hope that uh, that doesn't uh, come to fruition. I hope that we do come out of here with some type of tax relief for Western Union taxpayers. That'd just be such an odd moment, you know, when, having having total control over all three houses, or all three uh, segments of government, and and not getting the thing that everybody wants. It just well, it, it would it would it would be some some sort of 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 percentage of dysfunctionality. I mean, it just to me, I mean, it, it shows that there would be some dysfunctionality in trying to get this across the finish line. And you know, and with that being said. I think the House, I mean, you saw the vote that came from the House. And, and you know, the first two weeks I was down here, uh, the finance chairman has been very kind to me. Um, he let me pretty much take the run with that bill when the once the, the governor had announced what he was doing. I worked with the majority leader, um, worked on the House side. I, I, I worked with finance staff. I presented that bill on the House floor. I defended the uh, amendments on that bill. So, I, you know, I know that piece of legislation very, very well. And it seems like, you know, the House members are very uh, confident with it. The executive branch seems confident with it. Um, it's just trying to pull our Senate colleagues into having that same confidence with it that we have. Do you get the sense that the the Senate, which is obviously largely, hugely largely Republican, um, are they united in their uh, resistance to the House bill? Or is is it just at the leadership level? Do you have a feel for that? I don't. I don't because I'll tell you it's it's so it's a it's a little strange. And I've talked about this before. Um, when we come down here and we're working, we it's, we don't have a lot of interactions with each other. Um, you know, all the senators from the Eastern Panhandle are my friends, and I have dinner with them when we are home, and and we go to functions together. And I just don't see them a lot when we're down here because everyone is so busy trying to get their own stuff done. It's a sixty day. You know, it's very hectic. Um, I've, now I've moved into a, what I would consider a, a semi-leadership role. Uh, your time, I actually have two people that are waiting outside of my office right now to meet with me. It, it, your, your time is, is, is tasked greatly. There's not a lot of time. Uh, you guys know what good friends me and Jason Barrett are. Uh, we would go to dinner, you know, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week when he was in the house. I haven't even seen him since I've been down here. I've seen Summer, but I haven't seen Jason. He's busy doing his thing, and I'm busy doing my thing. And I'm sure somewhere here in the session we'll get together and go have dinner. But, you know, your time is 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 you, you're spread very thin. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, are you, are you prepared to talk about, or are you, are you the right guy to talk to, about the campus carry bill? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm more than willing to talk about it. I was a sponsor of it when it came. Okay. It, it, was, it was introduced in the House uh, two years ago, and I was one of the sponsors. Uh, I've always thought very strongly that your Second Amendment rights did not end when you walked onto a college campus. Um, so the Senate was the ones that had the issues with that bill the last time. So when that bill came back up, uh, I think the decision was made to let the Senate run it and let them get what version they could get out of their house and then bring it uh, to our side of the Capitol and, and let us take a look at it from there. So, yeah, I support that legislation 100 uh, percent. I don't believe that you your Second Amendment rights – stop when you walk onto uh, a school campus. Uh, I believe that uh, you're creating these gun-free zones and creating uh, just areas of opportunity, and I do believe that uh, uh, people have the right to defend themselves and protect themselves. I had dinner last night um, just by happenstance with the the spouse of a a senior executive, I guess, at Shepherd University, and the concern um, among the administration, apparently, is that the, a campus carry bill will discourage uh, students, potential students from uh, states like Maryland from applying. Is that is is that part of the consideration? I, I, I have zero concern about that. I think that's just another scare tactic, another uh, piece of information that would be spread. Uh, I think it would have zero concerns about that. I have a feeling once you pass the campus carry bill, um, the people who are carrying now uh, and are trying to keep that from being known from any of the uh, staff uh, because they don't want repercussions from that will still carry. Uh, I I don't believe that there will be any repercussions from that piece of legislation from out-of-state 
en- en- enrollees coming um, to Shepherd University or any of the other universities. Delegate John Hardy, our guest, he is the vice chair of finance, elevated to that position this year for the first time by the Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw. Uh, John, I want to read a comment to you from our Facebook commenting community. And Damon Wright, who's a member of the Board of Education here in Berkeley County, wrote, I want to thank Delegate Hardy for thus far not sponsoring or co-sponsoring many of the cultural bills of the extreme right. And it made me think for a second that I really haven't heard a lot coming from that part of the Republican Party in this legislative session. Is it that they're not being that active, or is the noise from the tax cut bill just sucking all the oxygen out of the room down there right now? Um, You're going to see some of those what we call, for lack of a better term, red meat bills, those Republican red meat bills. You're going to see some of those come through. Um, there, ha- I mean, there's a there's a portion of um, delegates down here that are working on some of that stuff. And I'll be completely honest with you. I, I have not signed on to a lot of legislation this year. I was just thinking, you know, I have about five pieces of legislation that I'm running myself. Uh, and I haven't signed on to a lot of legislation uh, because I don't make it out of my office a lot, to be honest with you. There's, <laughs> it, it, there's, I don't have a lot of time to, to spend on the East Wing and walk around and look at people's legislation and try to sign on um, to, to bills. So I'm sure that those bills are out there floating around. I have not seen too many of them. I know, I know of a few that are probably going to come up later on in the session. Um, but I was just thinking the other day, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm really not on a lot of legislation this year because I haven't really had the time to dedicate to go and talk to other delegates, read um, things that they are passionate about and trying to get across the finish line um, this year. So I really need to try to start trying to do a better job of that. I did see one bill while I was skimming through the other day. It was, it was I think it was, I don't know what it was, number was, and essentially it was an in, in God We Trust bill that uh, would have, I think, schools put in God We Trust somewhere in the building. I'm not sure exactly where it would be. Are you familiar with that at all, John? No, I, I haven't seen that. Everything that I've been working on has been finance-based, and we're still going through budget hearings, and the chairman has been uh, having some travel. He's had to do some travel for his position as the finance chairman so i've been pretty busy running most of the budget uh, hearings um and like i said i worked on the tax bill the first two weeks i was here um trying to get that thing across the finish line here on the house side uh and now i'm starting to work on uh the dhhr split bill so that i'm I'm also on the health committee and we were able to pass that bill out of health uh but it has some financial implications and the, the cost of the bill is going to be zero we're pretty sure that it's not going to cost the taxpayers anything to split those, the DHHR, but it's all in the segmenting of it. So it's kind of, it would remind you of like on Apollo 13, where they were trying to get the right amperage. The amperage was there, but it was all in the sequencing. Mm-hmm. And it's like that with the DHHR bill. The, the split is there, but it's in the sequencing to make sure that we don't lose any federal drawdown dollars. So we have to be very careful in how we break up the different parts of the agencies into more manageable sections. It looks like we're probably going to maybe break it into two sections now, uh, but we have to make sure that we're not going to lose any federal drawdown dollars that we may receive from Medicare and Medicaid or any other federal programs that will that back feeds DHHR. Back to campus. Carrie, Michelle McWilliams Coffee has a question for you as to whether or not you folks have looked into the effect that the insurance premiums may be uh, directly affected by the passage of campus carry for our many universities and colleges in the state of West Virginia. Well, I'm sure that there's someone that's looked into that. I, I'm like I said, I have not looked into that, but I don't believe that uh, your Second Amendment rights in when you walk onto a college campus. I believe you have the uh, constitutional right, the God-given right to be able to protect yourself uh, and to be able to defend yourself. So, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure that someone's maybe looked into that. I'm not sure if the schools are covered under BRIM which is the state insurance policy. They, they may be under BRIM policies because they are uh, state-funded um, schools. So, but, but I have not looked into that. No, I have not. John, you mentioned some of your own bills that you've been working on. Uh, which are the ones that have the most priority for you? Uh, number one priority would be excess tax reform bill to move that to 100%, um, which I'm 
I'm confident that that will pass House Finance and pass the House. I'm not sure how that's going to be perceived in the Senate. Uh, you know, I may have to use some – I'm not sure if they will just flat pass that if that goes through Senate Finance and get passed, if I have to use some – legislative trickery to try to incorporate that bill into a Senate bill that's moving. If I see a Senate bill that's coming over and is moving and then the code sections are closed, I can, and I can do a strike and insert of my bill into that bill. And so that's, that's top number one priority to try to get that's about $1.8 million for Berkeley County. Um, so that bill is pretty important. Um, let's see, what else am I working on? I mean, the tax bill is very important to me. Um, other legislation that I have. I have a piece of legislation, uh, just a small bill that lets the county council change their name back to county commission, just changes one line of code. It only affects Berkeley County. I'm directly in uh, favor of that, by the way. What, I'm sorry. I'm very much in favor of that. And, and yeah, most- John, on that note, I've only got about 30 seconds left, so I want to thank you very much for your time here this morning. Hopefully we can get you back on next week again. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, just say hey to everybody back home. Will do, sir.